This episode of Stuck in Vermont is made possible by Hotel Vermont and Vermont Tourism. We had a nuclear weapon out there, four megaton nuclear weapon. (laughs) Welcome to Stuck in Vermont, brought to you by Seven Days. My name's Ava Solberger, and we are not stuck in Vermont. We are actually in Lewis, New York, and we are standing in the Launch Control Center of a missile silo. We are actually underground right now, and this space that we're standing in is built to withstand a nuclear attack. He worked here yes. in my former home. <laughs> Australian architect Alexander Michael has restored this Atlas F missile site. My avatar is silo boy. <laughs> it's the only Atlas missile silo in the country that is even vaguely intact. What you might not know is that here in New York and in Vermont, we had 12 Atlas F missile sites. I've spoken to a lot of people that lived in this area whilst these things were operational and didn't know they existed. Until, you know, they started seeing these missiles coming up for practice launch exercises. Members from the 556 Strategic Missile Squadron all had a reunion here today. I'm here to show my appreciation to my fellow members of the 556. Zero 05, we called it, the okay. Lewis site. You've got free access to the whole site, go wherever yeah, you want. 50 years ago at this time, we were on alert. There was something going on here. This place was alive with activity, it really was. I had a little trouble sleeping last night. Makes my heart skip a beat. This is fantastic to get back down into one of these things. I never thought I'd walk down those stairs again, never. This weekend, the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum is opening, which brought many members of the 556 back to the area. They're carrying a body of knowledge with them that's not recorded anywhere. Nobody really understands the sacrifices these gentlemen made and their families. This is the missile away light. That's the one you never wanted to see go green. It never did. Just one warhead out here had more destructive power than all the bombs dropped in World War I and World War II combined. We did avoid that catastrophe, which may have wiped out the human race. At Cape Canaveral, the 51st launching of an Atlas intercontinental missile, originally scheduled for the eve of the ill-fated summit conference, but delayed for technical reasons. The Atlas fares better than the conference. It's a perfect launching. 1962. We're in the midst of the Cold War and we're in a missiles race with the USSR. We were facing what was known as the missile gap. Even today there's a lot of controversy whether that actually existed or not. (laughs) Across the country we were frantically building these Atlas F ICBM missile sites. Intercontinental ballistic missile. It carried a five megaton warhead. Time was of the essence. I think we felt that the Russians, they were ahead of us, you know, they are ahead of us. They are ahead of us. we got to catch up. we got to catch up. There were, what, five squadrons spread across the country that were identical to this, and each one of those had the same 12 missiles. Russia's threat was very real, and individual families built bunkers in their basements. Khrushchev, Castro, troublemakers. Nikita Khrushchev took his shoe off and pounded it on the desk in front of him at the UN and said, you know, we will bury your grandchildren. It was only during the Cuban Missile Crisis that they went into DEFCON 2 that things got really, really touchy. People don't realize how close it really came. Had we gone into DEFCON 1, that's when you push the buttons and arm the nuclear warheads. That's how close we were. Every one of us had to go through a psychological test 
I knew that on the other side of the North Pole, my counterpart who spoke Russian was sitting there just like me, waiting to do the exchange. Were you anxious or all the time, or did you just go with the flow? No, combat crew and strategic air command did anything casual. The crew that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima suffered a lot of psychological anxiety because they knew of the number of people they wiped out. Most nuclear crews have no idea where they're dropping. We were joking at the time that when it's all over, we'll go topside, but there won't be anybody left. You were what, 25 years old? I was 18, just turned 19. In today's world, how many people that age have that kind of responsibility? People in this generation aren't as pushed as hard. It's a very dangerous system, very dangerous place to work. And during the days it was alive with maintenance activity, people coming and going, that would calm down and you'd go into this, this nighttime mode. In here there were uh, bunk beds, two offices and the BMAT would try to get four or five hours sleep during the 24 hour shift. You had to have two men at the patrol console that were wide awake at all times. We were both deputy missile crew commanders. So our station was right, right here. here. The BMAT's responsibility was to know every part of the missile and every part of the silo. And behind me was a, a major facilities control panel. And those things were constantly going red in the middle of the night. <laughs> this is the utility tunnel. The silo itself is 50 feet in diameter, 174 feet down. It's basically the size of a 17-story building. Like the control center, this area is also, all the structure in here is also suspended completely off the floor. The whole thing goes up and down to protect it from a nuclear blast. <laughs> All of the st uh, strategic air command positive control stuff came through here. The go message had a certain code and color. The first sentence, you knew that that's the message you don't want to hear. And we got down to the point in the launch sequence where we came to commit. On my mark, five, four, three, two, one, mark. Keys were turned simultaneously and the commit sequence would start. These silos were built at great expense, costing between 14 to 18 million dollars for each site, and a mere two and a half years later, they were decommissioned. Everything was left. The missile went and the fuels went. All the guys kept coming up and saying, thank you for having us, it's really generous. And I was just kind of smiling inside, thinking, why, well, I'm getting much more out of this than those guys. <laughs> I was in for almost 25 years, and this was really only a small part of what I did. but. Uh... To this day, it's a major part of what I did. People my age consider the, the time they served their country as one of the most uh, important things they had done. Deterrence did work. We avoided that war. We never got to midnight. We never got to a launch point with this stuff. away. It's the button that never turned green. And I feel pretty good about that. We'll get stuck with you again real soon. Thanks to the members of the 556. A level two of the Launch Control Center, which was filled with colored lights. Hopefully most of them are green. I would turn the fluorescent lights off and I'd put on Miles Davis on my tape recorded. A few of my favorite things. Dun, 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 on a Revere tape recording. Yeah? You sit there in a chair, three in the morning, waiting for the phone to ring. Hotel Vermont is personal, purposeful, and natural. Rustic and modern. Unique, independent, and unlike anything else. It's fun, it's exciting. Hip and relaxed. It's Vermont, it's Burlington. Come down for a beer, come stay overnight. We'd love to see you.